looking at each other. Well, this was the detention center, but I can't imagine. Well, I think there's a, there has to be some, you know, a clarification. is nothing but idleness. I didn't say nothing but Now, wait a minute. Now, so almost that, it yes. depends upon, again, the point where you're at within the prison system, too. Now, you know, where we have a detentioner, certainly well, there's a lot I, of idleness, much really too much What I really like idleness. to say here, Dr. Joe, it's in order to get this thing on a uh, more narrow example of penology, is dealing with those criminals that have either been sentenced because are they attached to organized um, uh, crime or was it because of premeditated uh, reasons because of this particular act or is it because it was done an act of impulse and these questions has to be brought in first because these judges are the ones that are sentenced these prisoners for a long term confinement and rehabilitation, the word is used too loosely. And this is what I, I like to know for the amount of prisoners that I've been helping in order to clarify some of the problems that have been existing in society. Well, I have a theory on this, and if anybody's interested in hearing it, I oh think my. there are two or three kinds of people in prison and I'm frank to say that I don't believe that they all are quite within the scope of what the general public considers a criminal. They're treated as criminals, but they're not all really that kind of people. And I think there are people who are in prison simply because of the way they have to live. They live in <coughs> communities where it's almost impossible to stay out of uh, infractions which they don't know exist. Uh, I think Judge Dandridge has had this. I've had it. I've had people stand in front of me and say that this judicial system doesn't relate to me. I know what they're talking about. They just can't live without violating the law the way they have to live. Now, those people are not really criminals, in my judgment. They're people that are the victims of the social atmosphere in which they have to operate and live. Um, to say they're bad, I think, is wrong. I think you have to see what you can do for them. Someday, maybe our system, our entire system, will solve the problem of how people live in these areas which are so difficult. But I think that that's where you start, where a judge starts. When the man comes before me, I find out that he has lived. Are you prejudiced? No. I well, mean, when this man comes in front of you, are you prejudiced? Is Judge Dandridge no. prejudiced? Well, I don't, I don't. I mean, in a sense. <laughs> that, isn't the, that isn't the thought that comes to your mind, because I'm, what comes to your mind is. I made a statement that uh, if I come before you, I won't be sentenced to prison now. Will that follow through, or will you well, sentence me? Well, I don't me? think that's Because now you're being prejudiced. If you are, Judge Dandridge just said he's going to send me to prison if I commit a crime. Well, because I got money. <laughs> well, let me no, that's not that, what I said. Let, let me finish, finish this finish out, and then that. Judge Dandridge can answer that. But I just want to finish this. I, I think the first thing you do, you try to find out what kind of a person it is. And what is his background? And is he the victim of circumstances? Or is he just a very bad guy that is going to continue to shoot people if that's what he's doing, or knife people if he can, or, or steal, or burglarize? And this a judge can get a pretty good notion of this. And if he is, then you give him high bail. Now, if he's not that kind of a person, he's a victim of his surroundings, uh, he's never been in trouble before, he shouldn't be on bail. He ought to sign his own bail. But he ought to be somehow watched if you're worried about him. And this is where Wait I a think... Wait is this after you came back from a dinner engagement, 3 o'clock in the morning, 
When well, you're, raising into, you, you're, you're just raising uh, wait a stupid minute. questions. Why don't you let it happen? I'll, I would like I'll to give him a chance. No, you're I'm, not giving him a chance. Critical. You're breaking his continuity. I will. I will well, break give his him a chance now. Judge Andrew. Why I, don't you give him a chance now? Well, I, well, I have to break into certain points. No, you don't have to break He in. says that he right. made this distinction. He, well, he said that I finished he my made statement. it. Now, the yeah. pre-sentence, did he make it through a pre-sentence investigation? Well, I haven't gotten that far. Or was it done through his law clerk, who was Dick here, on the side? Now, who was it done by, or did you do it on your own? There are several stages at which people charged with crime come before a judge. I'm talking about an initial stage. Now, if he's convicted, then you've got another stage. The jury finds him guilty. Then you've got to decide on punishment. And here is where you get your pre-sentence investigation and report. You can get a study of his background, his family, his neighborhood. You can also get a psychological report and a neuropsychiatric report. So that by the time, and then you have his complete background record, so that by the time you're ready to decide what is best for everybody, society, the man himself, rehabilitation is a factor there, or some people talk about deterrence, I consider this very far down the line. Punishment, some people think is important. I don't consider that major. By the time you get to the sentencing, you have all this equipment. And you hope you to make a good judgment. You mentioned something there, Judge, that uh, I feel like reacting to. You talked about high bail. And I, I have strong feeling about <coughs> this bail setting. I think it is a discrimination against the poor. Now, two fellows are caught with burglary. And <laughs> the bail is $500. The man who has $500 is out in the street. The guy who doesn't have it is in there. And I think that this, as we think of our system of criminal justice, this is something to which we need to give very serious consideration. Judge, when you yeah. find out that this man needs uh, psychiatric treatment, what are you doing? What are you saying? Well, this, this, <coughs> this is a very wonderful question. And I think the general public ought to know that we really don't have as good facilities as we ought to have. I think Dick knows more about this, or Judge Dandridge can comment on it. We really are. You, you are raising a question. You know what you're saying yes. when you raise that question. I, th I think it's You have to sentence a, a person somewhere you don't want to send. Let me say right. this. I think the gentleman, right. someone earlier mentioned uh, one of the catchment areas, or the, the mental health catchment areas being so great. They're not doing anything because no. they're not getting any money, and they're not getting any support, and they were set up improperly because they were not set up bringing in the community as part of the total process. Now they are being fostered on the community, and the different communities are not accepting them. So they're in big trouble, and they're not able to really to do anything to help anyone. They also have a, a strong yeah. reluctance to work with offenders because they haven't had much experience dealing with offenders. They haven't had much. Up they don't have much staff. Question, with Dr. Joe, uh, if the judge uh, thinks somebody needs psychiatric treatment and he sends him to uh, the state prison, now you think your guards are capable, or the custodial force is capable of being retrained to relate with the inmates to their needs? The cust custodial I force as it is today. Well, what does this have to do with the question about psychiatric treatment, though? Well, he, he gets set for psychiatric treatment. Now, well, if, he's, if you buy if he's with a guard 24 hours a day, <laughs> right. yeah, you but see, if he is, he's relating if with he a guard most of the day. Yeah, but if he requires yeah. psychiatric treatment, mm -hmm. specifically psychiatric treatment, yeah. to the extent that he's out of it, we can't really keep him within our institution. We're going to be asking for transfer to a mental hospital. Well, uh, uh, if he needs psychiatric not treatment. Not that bad. Let's say it's not that bad. Okay, fine. But he needs psychiatric treatment. Okay, fine. Then we and can. He's with the guards. Then uh, we can put him into a program. Twenty hours where he, a day. Well, fine. We, right. I think he's with the guards more. Than he is with the, the psychiatric or, or uh, okay, psychological. Okay, but I think there are right? there are you know, officers who can be trained and have been trained let me ask to be able to deal effectively. So. Doctor, let me what ask you this. What I see personally. Well, I yeah, but you see, you know, but you see, there have been changes even within the last two years. Yeah, they make changes. Doctor, but they never change a custodial. Well, even in the custodial office. Can I can I cut through? Do you have in your prison or any of the prisons under your control any? facilities today to give prisoners who need psychiatric treatment the same? Psychiatric treatment? Yes. 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 Sufficiently. Well, you know, I well, how much, how much treatment, up to how much treatment can you give uh, a person a week by hours? Or can we put it on a monthly basis? Yeah. That's probably more no, realistic. No, not really. You're right, Dick. Uh, monthly, if the man right. has a you know, diagnosed need for therapy, uh, he can be in group therapy uh, at least once a week. With trained? With trained personnel. therapists. Uh, individual therapy once a week. If necessary, it can be adjusted to uh, twice a week. If he needs psychiatric management, he'll be seen by the psychiatrist on a weekly basis 
for psychiatric management. If medication is indicated, this will be administered. Or if uh, this type of Can individual in needs here? more intensive psychiatric treatment, he'll get psychiatric treatment Dr. by the psychiatrist. John, isn't psychotherapy uh, voluntary? Sure, it's voluntary. So uh, maybe some of these guys that go in there don't figure they need it. Why should it be voluntary? Why, it's not spelled out to a man that he needs this type of treatment. No, but it well, is spelled out. It isn't. It is spelled out. Talking about where it's it's part of his voluntary. It's not spelled out. Oh, it's Commitment. spelled out that no, he needs it. Either. It's spelled out that he needs well, it. Like whether he uses it or not, so it depends on him. being unfair about the, the whole The records concept. are kept pretty secret. Lou, hmm? everything they do, when, they, when you go in the um, diagnostic clinic and you're, uh, you, you fill out your forms and whatnot and you're examined, nothing is told yet you leave there. It's uh, all on your own. Dr. No, Joe, I no, think you, you're talking about unfair. when. Now, when, wait a minute. Are you, what, what are you talking about? Huh? What are you talking about when? When? Yeah. A few years back, not too far well, back. Okay, well, you fine, see, this but, is you know, what I'm but, trying to but say. But within that, the I framework of my experience, I don't overnight. understand this. They never do. At the framework of my experience, the man has pointed out what he needs. He you know, needs right. high school education. He needs psycho uh, psychotherapy. You put it on his record that he needs it. No, he's told us. The first, and this is part of the reason why, you know, we decide he'll go to a specific institution. When did they start that? Well, since I've been involved okay, in the program, that's what he's I'm been trying involved to state. in this. To See? The point that and the same way with you, Judge Barbaria. You're talking about pre-sentence investigation. How many prisoners are now in prison that had a pre-sentence investigation? How many people are, are wardens or superintendents are like Dr. Joe? Dr. Joe is what you call a new concept in penology. He just came in. We don't have any psychologist in the institution. He's about the only one we have. Well, and and, and you pre-sentence investigation, then we'll take the, mm -hmm. Judge Dandridge here, it's the same thing. Can you two people judge? are, I think two, you two, three people are not fair to the overwhelming majority of the prisoners that are confined at the present time. And this is the root of it. Then I say to you, take out all these people that are in there at the present time, give them a pre-sentence investigation again. Maybe you want some of them that are laying up there to Judge McDevitt sent there, 50 to 100 years, double life consecutively. Laying inside of an institution, you call that rehabilitation? You call that pre-sentence investigation? Or do you call it the new concept of psycho psychological effect? Joe, I think there's only one thing I want to point out. You're, you're right, you know, there are a lot of people who are institution who uh, haven't had pre-sentence reports. And many times when they have a, uh, you know, appeal before the court and uh, the court grants them a new hearing and a pre-sentence report is completed now, they're being released because you know, on the basis of what they're finding now, they should be released. But the point that I think I was trying to make out, there are a lot of psychologists now in corrections. There are not that many, certainly not enough to meet the, the barest need that we have, but there are more and more coming in. And, uh, you know, there are other mental health professionals who are, have uh, involved in, you know, the case workers, uh, the psychiatrists, and so on. And this is just a, a drop in the bucket. You don't have enough to meet the particular need. But I think the important thing is, is, is you know, we're talking about rehabilitation, we're talking about a rehabilitation of offenders, and I think there's a rehabilitation of prisons going on. And prisons are beginning to change, and I think we're thinking in terms of the stereotype. We criticize ourselves for yeah, thinking about inmates and offenders their, in terms uh, of stereotypes. But we're thinking also, uh, you know, uh, we can be very, you know, negative about, shouldn't think in terms of stereotypes, but we're thinking about prisons in terms of stereotypes. Yeah, there are a lot of things that haven't really changed. I want to ask you one things question, that are Dr. Joe, in front of everybody here. Uh, you know, you buy a steer, don't you? Mm -hmm. A whole steer. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me where the filet mignon goes to? Who does it go to? Where does the steaks go to? Does the prisoners eat filet mignon? Do they eat steak? Now, where are you asking about? I'm asking you, what do you do with this steer that you buy? Well, what we do. Yeah, what do you do with it? Is we use it for the for inmates' what? athletic banquet, the inmates' the athletic banquet, music banquet. Or is it for the wardens? No. Or is it for distinguished no. people that come up? No. Or is it for some other individuals? No, it's well, used. Where does it go at? It's used. Why don't you feed it to the prisoners? They are eating it. They are eating yes. it. Yes. I, 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 I think I would like to come back to the subject here. I raised the question about high bail, and I saw the. Paul there smile. I, I would like to know how he feels about this because I am concerned about the poor and I think that the poor needs justice just as well as those who can afford. Well, mm -hmm. I think more and more my feeling is that if the offense is one that requires bail, well, let's not uh, strike that. Because, you know, if it's an out-of-towner in Philadelphia and there's some question as to his appearance, you put a bail on it. If it's a native Philadelphian we're talking about, on a minor crime, we do not put a bail. It's a, you sign your own uh, bond and walk out. However, where there is a serious crime, 
And bail is required because the possibility exists that the defendant might flee. Then you put a bail. And I think you put a piece that you feel will be sufficient to keep the person from fleeing. Now, if it keeps him in confinement because no one will go his bail, uh, at this point, there's no way to get around that. And I don't know how you can get around it. Because the alternative would be that you would put no bail on him and he would be able to flee the jurisdiction. Judge, I recently completed a, a study involving bail for the Pennsylvania Prison Society. And uh, it came up with quite a few interesting things. And uh, I honestly feel that the uh, setting of bail needs more regulation. There is such a wide discrepancy between what happens when one judge is sitting at the bail arraignment and another judge. For instance, there's one judge that as soon as he hears the word marijuana, that the bail can be $30,000 if there's one marijuana <laughs> cigarette. That is correct. <laughs> and I don't want to mention this judge's name, but it's, he's being totally unrealistic. While there are other judges, when the same thing happens under one or two marijuana cigarettes, one or two joints, it will be nominal bail. So that's one discrepancy. Secondly, there's a discrepancy of what happens uh, in the city and out of the city. Right now, something very interesting and horrifying happened in uh, Montgomery County. A new set of bail regulations was instituted whereby uh, the, strict, the rules are so strict that all of the bail bondsmen decided that it's impossible for them to operate, they could not make any money, and therefore they're not writing any bail. And so the only ones who can get on, out on bail are those who have property in, this, in the county. And these are generally the rich ones. So if a poor man gets a $100 bail or a $500 bail for a relatively minor offense, unless he has property right now, he cannot get out. Now, hopefully, this is a temporary situation. And this is one abuse that occurs. Um, there are quite a few other abuses. And the setting of bail needs further regulation. And it's ridiculous. In many cases, while uh, Judge Dandridge might set nominal bail, let the man go on his own recognizance, other judges will set high bail. And there are many people who are sitting in prison today who are there only because they can't post the $35 bond premium, which might be in effect for a $300 bail. And I came across several people who were in the Philadelphia prison system because they could not pay or did not pay the $1 and nominal the, bail. And could be to, innocent, too. Of this course. Is very true. I think associated with this, too, and I would like to hear someone of the judges speak to it, is the right of an inmate to a speedy trial when he has this high bail put on him. All right, let me say this to you. As far as one thing is concerned, there are certain criminals in the city of Philadelphia, some of which I have some knowledge, and were any of them that I'm thinking about to commit a, an assaultive crime where they shot someone or beat up someone, I would not hesitate at all to put bail of $150,000 on them because it would be my intention to keep them locked up until such time as their trial came up and hopefully uh, make sure that they were not out because of pr knowledge about them and what they're going to do to assault someone else. And if that takes up the question of bail uh, for detention purposes, then I'm for it in a limited extent. Yeah, but I, I don't think that you would uh, disagree you're, you're with the fact. That follow. I don't think I've already prejudged. Yeah, I, know, yeah. I don't think you would disagree <laughs> with the fact that the, the poor uh, is discriminated against when it comes no to the question of bail. No you question. Know? And no, I no think that is. Uh, and then the next thing is, uh, you know, I've met many people, and I have strong feeling about those people who are detained at the detention center, where they sit there and sit there and wait. And I think they have a right to trial to determine whether they're guilty or not and put them where they belong or put them back in the street. Reverend, things are being yes. done about that at the present time. Uh, very recently, reforms or changes have been instituted by a court administrator, Blake, and by the uh, courts in Philadelphia, whereby those people who are in prison awaiting trial are put on a special arraignment list. So they come up much sooner for their trial. Instead of being on the bail arraignment list, which would come up maybe a couple of months after their, uh, after their arrest and preliminary hearing, they're on an expedited prison arraignment list. So that the time is being cut down for those people who are awaiting trial. It's unfortunate that they have to wait some time, and hopefully this will be cut down even further in the future. But I think, uh, going back, if a uniform bail system where all minor crimes are all, you know, are treated the same at bail arraignment, then the, it should be applied the same, and they wouldn't have to spend even that little time in jail. Right. But the thing is that some people exercise their, and we all do in a way, their prejudices and put bail on people. 
knowing they can't make the bail and that they're going to be confined simply because uh, it's, they, they have allegedly been caught in an offense that that particular judge finds distasteful to him. Okay. And therefore, you know, he feels that there should be a bail rather than a nominal bail, and he therefore sets it. The, the bail situation uh, seemed to be coming uh, into an area where there would be some uh, decent regulations just a short while ago when we had the uh, bail project. Now, this bail project seemed to work very well. And what happened was people who were held in good bail, 300, 500, 1,000 or more, were uh, subjected to uh, questioning uh, voluntarily, of course, and by the personnel from the bail project. If they determined that this person had a certain number of points, that is, he had been a resident of Philadelphia for a certain period of time, he'd get a few points. He was working, he had a family here, uh, seriousness of, of crime, and a few other factors. If he accumulated enough points on this scale, then he would be recommended for release on his own recognizance. Now this happened and they found out that many, many people who ordinarily would wait in jail would, could be released, were released, and that these people showed up and that a great many of them were found not guilty. And this program was very, very effective. Unfortunately, there wasn't any money. Uh, I think that uh, the administration uh, in the city recommended the allocation of money, but somehow it just disappeared. And various places, the prison society, the courts, et cetera, everyone said, we want this program. But somehow the money disappeared, and I think it's something that concerned citizens could do uh, to make sure that people who are in prison <coughs> for no good reason, except they can get the 35 or $50, that these people be allowed to get out and allowed to work during trial. And people don't realize that it's not just the, the, the fact that the person is in prison, but his family is probably on relief. He's not, a, um, he's not a taxpayer, he loses his job. And so many things happen when a person is in jail, even when he's not guilty. And quite a few who are in for these minor crimes should be out, there's no doubt about it. Most of them should be out, Most not of them. all of them. We're not talking about the people who are there for, for murder, the people who are um, accused of violent crimes and who have a history of violent crimes and who are on probation. Uh, thing, uh, Maybe, certainly these type of people should be uh, awaited, should await trial in jail. And of course, even they should be given a speedy trial as soon as possible. Uh, I would like to shift back uh, to uh, Warden John here. And uh, I have feeling about uh, trying to do psychiatric uh, treatment in a custodial institution. I think that in, a, in an institution set up for therapy, uh, the psychiatrist sees himself as the inmate's physician, you know, his first responsibility is to that person, that patient. Whereas I don't think this is true of the custodial setting where we think of society and our responsibility to society. Well, I think you're looking at it from a rather narrow point of view and probably a very personal point of view because you've never done therapy in a correctional facility. Having done therapy in a correctional facility for a number of years, uh, I don't feel this is necessarily so. Uh, you know, I started off as a psychologist in a correctional setting, and I felt that I was responsible to society, responsible to the institution, but also responsible as a therapist to the patient I was working with. I had to make whatever adjustments I had to make to help this patient move ahead to grow whatever was disturbing him to help him to overcome this particular situation. And I think that whether it's a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker, we look at it as a dual responsibility, not to help the inmate to conform to the institution, not to help the inmate to conform to society, but to help the inmate make the best possible adjustment for him so that when he is eventually released, he's going to be able to make the maximum use of all his talents, his assets, and so on. Now, it may mean that he has to, you know, knock heads against some of the frustrations of society and so on but it means he also has to learn how to deal with these particular frustrations differently. Uh, there isn't a real problem there. Uh, you know, we, we're able to function within the framework of a correctional institution. Uh, right. No different than in a mental hospital situation where the psychiatrist is in control of whether the man is released or not released. Yeah. We don't have that authority. You know, we do know that the Board of Parole is going to make the final determination in our particular situation and so on. And so that, you know, we can do all we can to help the man prepare for this particular situation. Uh, I think, you know, you have to really be able to be a part of this particular situation because this is one of the things that new professionals 
define as a real problem for them. Can I really do my job and still be able yes. to function? At I the, think at they the, do. At the, at You're the US, philosophy, at the right. justice, I a, man. I a, may I just uh, make this observation? I have shared uh, Reverend Parkinson's view for a long time and had the same question. Uh, from what I know, and I don't know enough about psychiatric to be an expert on this, but it seems to me that while you may um, resolve some of this man's problems where you've got him within the walls of a prison, uh, I've always felt that even though your people say, well, we think he's all right, he's ready to go, that maybe he isn't quite ready to adjust to something outside. He's got to adjust to people. Okay. And these are people that are different from prison people. And I always have wondered if, and I suppose you do do this, doctor, I'm pretty sure you do, keep an eye on this fellow and sort of keep him um, uh, under the whatever uh, routine or regimen you've established for him, even after he's trying to adjust to society. Oh. Uh, I think I uh, think is this is what you had in mind. I yes, think to answer your question, we don't think that you know in many adjustment cases adjustment in a prison isn't we can, the same as adjustment to the world. We can't complete it. And we have to help the you man to move what? into the community they re they and continue to his therapy. The prison but life. Do you do it actually? What you know when he's ready to leave prison? Is there anything to bridge the gap between prison and society? Well, yes. What actually as part of the recommendation for pro, we may recommend that he go into therapy. This is where we get you know in conflict with. You know, the lack of resources in the community, but we do find resources. You know, if this is a need, uh, either with a private psychiatrist or a private therapist or through the community mental health clinics to some extent or through the Board of Paroles group therapy program and so on, so that the man is able to make, you know, some adjustment, the transition. Uh, part of the program this we is after he's been put on, placed on parole, not before. Yeah. Well, no, there's a this program you know, prior this is a, to release. This is great. There is this a pre-release program which prepares the man for release. Uh, where he's out in society? No. No, he's in, in the, the community. Okay. In the community. There's a pre-release program going on which, sure. you know, prepares the man. Uh, it brings in outside resources from the community which trains the man in terms of Wonderful. what to expect and so on. Good. Then the next logical step is the pre-release center which, you know, Joe has talked about before that we try to establish got it working for a month and then had to close down but is not an end uh, as far as we're concerned we'll have a pre-release center but, operating but there is no center right now and there hasn't been except for a period of one there's month. two yeah. operating in the state there's none in philadelphia well, I'm talking about in philadelphia area. doesn't no. want any doctor i'd like to ask one question but the about point is this. Uh, uh, would it be feasible i've always thought that instead of pre-release which is great because you train him but could you would it be sensible to have everybody that is going to eventually go on parole at least be on a trial work release basis you know where he comes back to the prison each night maybe give him a week of this to see that he gradually works his way back i've often wondered if this, this might not be helpful this is a concept of course in the county prisons they can use this and of course eventually when the you know movement takes place we're going to be able to uh, establish this with regional jails but this particular problem that you're bringing up more years. is a problem i think that faces uh people who are working in the correctional facilities now, the whole sentencing structure that we have now precludes some of our, you know, doing some of these particular things. A man has a five to ten year sentence, and he has to do time for five years. Two years may be sufficient to be able to move the man out, but we're limited. We can't move him out until that five years is up. Now, you know, if there was a change in sentencing structure, where, you know, where the man has made enough of progress, and this is another thing, you talk about as was mentioned here by Ray, uh, the inmates don't really know about this. The inmates do know about this. There is not a man who isn't told about this because he's told over and over again. Uh, the point is, is that I they're not like interested. You're hedging on us. No, yeah. I'm yeah. saying yeah. they're, 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 they're not interested. Yeah. They're, 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 they're not interested until their parole. Let me, let me get a word They're not in interested here. until parole is coming around the corner. All of you are sitting down here real nice, sure. Get treatment, get this, get that, get everything that you want to give them. Give them all the, uh, everything they want to give. But what? where is this man getting the money to feed himself? You don't even give him a dollar, Dr. Joe, when he leaves that prison. Not one dollar. You used to give him $10 before. Who are you talking sitting there I'm not real talking nice? About you give him a dollar a day, and he's allowed to, if, if he gets a dollar a day, dollar get 10 a day? cents a day. I'm talking about the most, what the do you ones mean, that work. Cents a day? How much does he get? 20 cents a day, which you have to spend for commissary? The minimum is 25 cents a day. You're talking about this guy going to see a doctor when he comes out. The minimum is 25 cents He has no apartment. He has no clothes. He has no money. He has, doesn't even toilet paper. 
let alone going out and say, go do Where this and do that. It? Where doesn't he have these? When he what goes out, when, when he goes out, goes out, you give him a suit of clothes that he wants to throw away with the first time he gets a hold of him that he knows he's a prisoner. What do you do when you put him out the you gate? You talk broke. real nice, but you don't know the, the real facts. The average the facts out the gate, are money for then a man what? going you, out. The average layman can't get an apartment today, let alone a prisoner. Well, now, wait a minute. Where is he going to buy his clothes? Where is he going to get 50 cents to get on a trolley car to go downtown? Are you going to give it to the judge that gave it to him? Are you going to give it to him? Yes, I gave it to him. Well, all right. Yes, we have to count. On people like That's you right. are going to give What difference one. does that make? One. If there's only one. Right. The point is, is that this is all a part of yeah, society's that's, response. Society, That's dangerous. That's we're the not truth. interested in, put in you out having broke. people, you know, say, fair. hey, but wait a minute, you know, wait a minute, you said, look, Whose responsibility why did that judge send him to college? It Whose cost $2,700 yeah. to incarcerate Whose that man. Whose responsibility is if this is Just not society? Just a minute. Let me finish the facts here. I have facts. Everything goes on society. I don't just come off the air. It cost $2,700 to incarcerate a man. You could send him to college. Why didn't he send him to college? Why did he send him to the institution? He can get all, he can become a psychologist. Because he violated a law. He violated what law? Well, Whatever he was he... sent to prison for. Oh, you mean now, the judge sent to prison? Then you want to send 30 million people away to prison because they violated a law. They violated what that? law? Maybe it be that? nice if Sam, you've made a re readjustment yeah. to society. Yeah. Maybe you can con contribute something to this discussion. <laughs> well, I don't know. It seems like uh, we're uh, trying to uh, get at two different things at one time. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I can't follow the uh, drift of it. But uh, yes, I made a, an adjustment because myself, inwardly, I wanted this adjustment. I wanted to reaffirm and re, uh, as as we say, re rehabilitate minute, ourselves. Jackson. Yes. Did you make an adjustment? You were pardoned. Who wanted you? Uh, well, why don't you let him answer? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He said he made an adjustment. Joe, isn't, it, isn't it the thing for man to speak for himself? He, and not I, but I want to correct him, though, first. Let him, because he, you know, his recollections are not true. He didn't say I, that he came out on parole or probation. Well, I'm just he said saying. He made an adjustment. He made an adjustment, but why did he make an adjustment? Well, why don't well, we let, let him, him, let him, him, let him, let him well, answer? That's what I want to hear. Well, we'll let him give, give him a chance. He wasn't saying it. To your satisfaction. Not my satisfaction, um, to the society <coughs> satisfaction. Go ahead. As, as I said, I, um, I did, within myself, readjusted myself uh, that I wanted to uh, change. I'm not speaking about uh, how or why I got out. I'm saying within myself, I did. Uh, now, uh, I don't know. Uh, I found that. Uh, uh, in the prison, uh, when I first went in, uh, there was not um, facilities for this. You, you uh, were better and so forth, and uh, uh, you didn't make this adjustment. But uh, in later years, uh, that uh, uh, things was introduced into the prison that I believe that uh, you could take apart if you yourself wanted to uh, bridge this gap. Uh, in other words, I. Uh, uh, fathered my education, completed it. Uh, when I went in, I was only at the high school level, and when I left, I uh, had finished uh, the high school and had uh, a little bit of, uh, of the college uh, 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 education. Uh, also, I uh, went in as an unskilled uh, person. I come out, I was skilled in the field of printing industry. Uh, I also uh, uh, were skilled in the clerking field. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these, although I was trained for them, I did not uh, or could not uh, uh, get into this once I was outside. But uh, I don't know. Just uh, you know. Well, why uh, was that? I think I think we'd like to hear why you couldn't get into your things for which you were trained in uh, prison. As I would say, Judge, uh, the parole system was in such a way that uh, you had to uh, tell on your application or you had to tell your employee that you were an ex-convict by saying that you were on parole. Uh, and uh, it just seemed that, uh, well, uh, there were employers that uh, just could not accept this. Uh, they would uh, turn you down. Uh, I don't say everybody, I'm saying of uh, uh, quite a a lot of us. Was uh, that recently? 
Uh, yeah, well, no, I'd say uh, uh, this was back in the 60s. And, uh, so uh, here is where I think that work release can help, and yes. I think that the administrators around the Philadelphia area are uptight about it because it's happening in the federal penitentiaries and happening very well. It's and happening. this is why I said that the, the good Dr. Joe here was not giving, coming through because he never got to the work release program, yeah. even in the county prison. Well, no. okay. well, can't they do this in the they, state prison? county prison has a work release program permitted by law. We do not have it permitted by I law. Think that's the the nearest thing we have to it we is the pre-release center, center, which is, just right. as good. Which is not the law. Now, yeah. having a work like release program in a county system is fine. We just can't have it under the law. If the law permitted it, that's something else. Right. So there is this business of the you know, pre-release, which is a work release program from a community facility, not from the institution well, let itself. Let me ask you this. It seems to me, and I don't know whether you do this, that there should be a greater relationship, a better relationship between the business public and the prison authorities to change, and, and public relations really, to change the, the concept that all prisoners are going to be recidivists and, or, or all convicts coming out, becoming ex-convicts are going to be recidivists and you shouldn't hire them, to the point that most of them, and I think this is clearly understood, given the proper job and, and the proper surroundings are going to be completely rehabilitated. And that once they start making the jobs available, you know, on the part of business, instead of saying, no, you're an ex convict we can't hire you, the, the, total, the total image of the matter will change. I think this is yeah. very true. Now, there has been a lot of movement in that particular area. As I mentioned in this pre-release program, we've had people from local industries coming in and meeting with the men. Yes. There isn't really right. anybody who had been going out, say, in the last year that didn't get a job that they couldn't, you know, they weren't accepted by somebody. We had a few people who had some difficulty in getting a particular job, but there are resources. This is something you've been At working the point on that we were just <clears throat> recently, we're meeting with the Delaware Valley Industrial Relations Group, and we're all set for a program this past October in which we're going to bring representatives from industry in and specifically point out where they can be of help and work out a council, the whole type of situation. This is necessary, certainly. This is some of the things. But you know, when we're talking about what we should be doing, and we're talking about some of the things that we're moving toward this particular thing, uh, we always find that there's always some, you know, something wrong with the prisons, and there are things wrong with the prisons, that immediately say, well, anything they're doing is no good. So that if we start to move towards a pre-release program, if you move to a pre-release center, if, if the law was changed, if we had a work release program, if we had a, uh, uh, you know, this industrial relations group and so on, because somehow in the mind of the public and in the mind of the uh, judges, as well as everybody else, and so on. There's this negative feeling about prison. Anything the prisons are doing is wrong. Well, what are you doing to change that? Seeing you say you yeah. run such a pretty good facility, and I, I didn't say that. Do. These didn't men say that. that it takes time, I but I that. think it takes. So what are you doing to change yes. the image? Are you are you getting to the judges? But are you getting to the yes, public? Yes, I. Well, we're trying to, but you know, but you see, we yeah, have, have people. Well, now wait a minute. That's not true because Judge Barbieri has been up to the institution. He's visited the institution on several times. He's been aware of these things. When, when have you been up to the institution? I've been today? there. I'll be there sometime in March. We'll come up to Philadelphia. Uh, come to Dr. Joe. Uh, Dr. Joe, I, Joe, I just want to say, Joe. I just want to say about these thing. jobs, I think Dr. It's important Joe. But, you know, the still, we didn't know some of the things that you're saying now that you're trying to do. And I'm sure Judge Barbieri didn't. I think I've gotten it better, there. but I think, I think Sam made a statement earlier today that the general public ought to know that, and they ought to be told that the recidivistic rate isn't what is being advertised. Not, Would you state that again, not Sam? Not the general public. Just the administrators. Would you state that again? Not I the think general it's worth public. Just having the it repeated. Sir. Yeah. Just the administrators. <laughs> yes, not the general public. Uh, there was a like statement. Like the uh, district attorney and the mayor yeah, and Joe, the council. Joe, get Joe, yeah, yeah, I'll get him in, but I want to, I want to get some statements in, well, too, the people because that I'm a little... You know, this you thing get has been going on for in. 20 years. <laughs> you sir. get your statements and in. And I force them in. It's <laughs> wonderful for you to talk, and it's wonderful for Jack the, and the rest of the fellows here to talk. But I have went through it and spent all my money doing it. And this is where I have to come in, because there was nobody else. You have else me, sir, as a captive audience. That's I have right. to listen to you. I can't but Dr. Move. Joe just made a statement. He says, there's jobs. And clergy here, I want you to read this letter I got right in my briefcase. Prisoner sends out. It goes from the uh, telephone directory, from A to Z. Did you ever see a telephone directory? I'm sure you have. And he responds. Four of them was clergies. No jobs, no nothing, not even a response. Didn't even give him a letter back, you know? Dr. Joe says we got plenty of jobs. We got like about 800 of them right now that can get out tomorrow morning 
that don't have no jobs. Where's these jobs you're talking sure, about? I didn't say we have plenty of them. You just I said, said that, that there are jobs, jobs for men who are going to What kind of jobs? Out. Dishwashing, car washing, labor, working in hospitals. What kind of jobs are you talking about? Would you believe about? that there was a question on the floor that Sam was about to answer before you went Well, he can answer, but I'm yeah, I think, I'll tell I you think, what I'll do with you. In fairness, Joe, I uh, think the general public that employs people you, would be interested in hearing Sam's statistic, and I think we ought to let him say it. Yes. I really think so. Well, he can hear it. You can listen to him, but this is an open discussion, and I'm we going to go through well, that well, again. Okay. Okay. Yes. 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 Say something. He can say it. You feel free to say it. Well, you, but what I don't you, what think this man, him? I don't think this man is as averse to it as much well, as I am. Well, why don't you let this man talk? He has a mouth. Right. Let him talk. Okay, he'll talk. You know, enough is enough. Now, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, uh, Joe is misunderstanding what uh, the judge asked me to repeat. Uh, it was a question raised, or it was a statement made, rather, that uh, this prop, uh, person and the society said 50% of the men that were released are repeaters. And I, I uh, disagreed with him because I knew that uh, I had uh, read and was uh, uh, been informed that only about 2% of the men that are released. Uh, and what this was uh, asked were, and was uh, baited on was what happened to the other people that are doing good. Nobody never hears anything about them. They only, the press and everybody is only uh, uh, are aware of the 1% or 2% of the people that, are, uh, that do repeat only through the press publicizing that this man is an ex-convict. I think there is a uh, concentration or an emphasis on the sensationalism <laughs> so that when somebody is picked up yes. and they are an ex-convict, that is what is brought out. Yes. But um, all, every time that someone is picked up and he's not an ex-convict, no one mentions anything. Th it's a it. natural thing for the press or for anyone who's going to make something which is readable to the public to emphasize the fact this man was let out of prison, this man is on parole. But no one is saying anything about the thousands of people who have been let out who are doing very well. Yeah, now, one other, one other thing that I wanted to mention was that I think it's important, now that we see that there are jobs available, and now that we're going into work release and into pre-release centers, that the institutions shift from the stereotyped uh, jobs which have been available. So far, there has been training available in certain areas where there is no need in the community. So people are learning how to make socks and how to make certain types of shoes and leather goods and things which are, are needed for prisoners. But when they get out, they find that there isn't a corresponding job in the community. I think it's very important at this time that the institutions find out what type of jobs are available, the type of technical jobs which, which are needed. And there are plenty of jobs available in certain areas. And if this type of skilled labor is uh, produced and there is training, then I think it will be much easier for the person to get accepted in a job. Uh, people who are trained in specific areas uh, uh, involving technical training skills, I think can find it very easy to get a job where there's a need, whether or not are, they are prisoners or ex-prisoners. I think that's the important point now. I think that a lot of men who have been trained in a specific area, you know, the market is not necessarily available in that particular uh, skill. And so, you know, they don't have a job uh, for them in this particular uh, uh, time. Uh, as, as we mentioned here in the print, uh, 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 printing industry. Uh, not necessarily all printing industry is negative toward, you know, ex-offenders, no. but there are some. Uh, but there are other skills that, uh, you know, uh, Sam could have perhaps learned uh, which would be more marketable well, now. You know, we have a change now. Following what Dick has said, do you have in your staff, among your staff, anyone that can project as to what the job market will be in the areas uh, where the most saleable skills are needed so you can direct your training we, to them? We uh, have this available from the State Employment Service, which, you know, projects the market uh, 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 for various uh, jobs and so on. Is it followed, though? But well, we get the material, but we can't shift a, an industry, for instance, uh, because the industry has become a part of a you know program really where people are operating. Now you know you can't take something that belongs to a, to a, a system and scrap it. Uh, we can develop a new industry. Does the system take the people into it when they come out? What system? Well, the system that you're saying you can't take and scrap because people put something into it. 
No, it doesn't take it into it. Well, you know, I don't understand what you're saying is, is, is the point. Well, let's that say... you can't shift the system. Let's say, let's assume we have a printing uh, industry let, let going on. A, let me give now, suppose specific. printers really were not in demand in society at, at some particular time. We just can't scrap the printing industry because we have men who are in this particular thing, and it's providing a specific function in the system. Now, we have to come up with a new industry. We have to come up with a new industry that would meet society's needs, whatever it may be. Let's say... Uh, Computer. We have developed a program now in UNIVAC training in computer repairs and so on. Now, this is the thing we're pushing. So we have a whole system of programming, computer repairs, computer operations, uh, key punch, and so on. So now this is becoming the strong industry, and the printing industry will fall back. Mm -hmm. Now, we move into something else, say, uh, machinery. Uh, automobile hose repairs. Make, well, automobile repairs. This is always a standard part of the program. But let's say take hose, uh, hose manufacturing. Uh, there isn't much need for this particular thing because of the mechanization and so on. So there'll be gradual replacement of these facilities. Is there now gradual replacement? Yes. It's, it's, it's going on. But it's not a complete thing where you can retool like you can in industry. Because we're not... In, what you're working on is what you're We don't have the capital that industry has. We don't get state funds for this. This has to be self-supporting. So that the money that is helping to develop the computer program is the money that's being made on any profit that's being realized from the print shop. If you throw away the print shop, you don't have the money to buy the computer parts. Uh. So computer parts are self-sustaining, which will then, you know, develop something else. Now this is part, of the, when you have a closed system where you don't have any outside resources, you don't have any state funds being put into it, this is all self-sustaining. Joe, I think luck in I getting industries for you. Come in uh, you don't have to answer it. Yes, Not really, they haven't come in and, and uh, uh, financed small projects. Is it true that there is a certain type of printing in the institution that Negroes are not allowed to learn? Uh, was this your experience, or did you ever hear of this? Uh, no, uh, uh, Reverend, I, I can't say that. Uh, now, I'd say uh, years and years ago, uh, we, we knew there was uh, discrimination, uh, but that was because the institution itself was segregated. Uh, uh, we say uh, 20 some years ago uh, there was uh, what they would call the white uh, man's job and there was what they would call the black man's job. Naturally he was the uh, man that did all the manual uh, type labor. Uh, I believe uh, I can truthfully say uh, I was one of the first blacks to uh, leave the, be in the print shop and uh, was put on the press. I uh, 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 started this. Uh, then from that, I uh, was fortunate enough that I moved from the janitorial system in the print shop into uh, office management, believe it or not. Uh, this was in a, during a period of an, over a period of a number of years. But uh, years and years ago, there were uh, a little discrimination. Uh, in fact, it was uh, was in Sam, Sam, what is the most but the here, in the let, let, here <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> recently, in a, in a great, <laughs> that this is not so. What's yes, the most skilled job in the print shop, as far as you're concerned? The most skilled job in the print shop, uh, uh, well, the modern, I imagine, is the uh, line screen, of type operator. Uh, line of type operator and uh, the uh, Offset uh, engraving, uh, engraving department uh, and. Uh, the screen printing, uh, offset printing. Now, who's been usually on them? Uh, your experience, white or colored? Uh, here in the last uh, f years, uh, Dr. Joe, I believe it is a lot more colored. But more colored than white. Really. Yes, well, that's because the overall the uh, the prison now is overpopulated well, okay. with with the blacks. So and uh, that, you know, we have to force uh, the yield. Yeah. Yeah. Out of proportion, the greater, the greater proportion. <laughs> out of proportion, <laughs> proportion <laughs> than they are in the, in the population. Yes, that right. Over uh, yeah. Yes, uh, this was uh, true. Sam, yes. Another question: Is there any segregation in the housing? Uh, no, not since the order have went down. We we say uh, no, uh, uh, not uh, since Commissioner Prassy have. Uh, uh, issued the order, there would be no more segregation. They have blacks and whites in the same uh, Same uh, lockup area. Uh, uh, we, the places would have uh, more than one man in a cell, I believe it, it is still uh, where whites lock uh, within the uh, cells together and the blacks lock. Uh, 
Yeah, so. And do but, you uh, do you feel that if you had access to a job release program, it would be easier for you to make the adjustment uh, if you had most this? certainly, yeah. oh, most certainly. Uh, this uh, uh, is one of the best things that I believe that uh, ev they have ever come up with is this pre-release program that and also uh, uh, train the training of a man to a job on the outside, let him get his job out there, get into it, and uh, work himself back into society that way, uh, which was not available to uh, the uh, fellows of 15, 20 years ago. I think that uh, we've heard a lot about the state prison system. I think that Sam was in the state prison system. What uh, uh, Dr. Joe has been talking about has been the state prison system, yet we have almost neglected our local county Philadelphia prison system and I think that the majority of people who are sentenced by our judges uh, to prison terms wind up in our local prisons and I think that it might be appropriate if we did do some discussion uh, if we discuss some of the things having to do with this now certainly the reforms I've been very glad to hear of these changes in the state system and that the reforms which are taking place that they're ch switching in uh, into areas of broader education and into job relevant job training and psychological and uh, assistance. But on the other hand, I think that we might discuss some of the things that are going on in the local uh, prisons. Now, one of the things which particularly disturbed me was the fact that uh, uh, the statistics show that a great many, a very high percentage of those people going into our local prisons are there be either because of drugs, either drug uh, crimes, possession, sale of narcotics, or because of drug-related crimes, that is, crimes of uh, larceny and burglary which were committed uh, to satisfy their addiction. And one of the things that disturbed me very much was the fact that the program which was, had just been started uh, for drug rehabilitation, for group therapy, had ended in the, in the uh, Philadelphia prisons. And so the people who are going up there now who really need some type of therapy are not getting it at all. And I'd like to know why that stopped. This was a program in Holmesbury, I believe. Right. This was a program well, in I Holmesbury. I know exactly why it stopped, because I wrote a letter to Paul Gernert. Um, actually, the very talented man named Paul Descano Descano, was right. running this um, uh, group therapy program in the detention center mm -hmm. and in the House of Correction, along with his other work as an agent under the state mm -hmm. parole system. And the state money got so low that um, the state system had to increase the load. Their load was reasonable at one time. It was like 60 or 70 for each agent, or maybe it was less than, maybe down to 50. Judge, in this particular unit, this is the drug unit of the Pennsylvania Board of Probation and Parole up at 1400, uh, Suite 1400 at the State Building in Philadelphia, they had about 30 or 35 was the maximum, sometimes as low as 25. And this allowed them to give special individual treatment to each of the people. And more and more people having to do with drug-related crimes kept coming out until this figure kept getting higher and higher. There wasn't any money to, to hire these people, uh, to hire extra people. And so the workload increased so much that uh, the parole board had to take away the uh, man who was given, who was at the prison, Paul Descano, who was doing an excellent job in conducting therapy. And now uh, uh, Mr. Descano is able to um, conduct therapy just for the state prison prisoners. But most of the people up there are city prisoners, and they get absolutely nothing. We're ready no. to start through the Greater Philadelphia Narcotics Council with the cooperation of our probation department and the cooperation of Superintendent Hendrick and the prison authorities. We were getting into a new era where people would be treated as soon as they came in the detention center. They would be able to volunteer for this group therapy. And all of a sudden, everything's taken away. The city doesn't have money, the state doesn't have money, and practically nothing's happening. Well, I think a judge's viewpoint of this, and I'm sure that Judge Dandridge will agree, to a judge, this is almost like a betrayal because my commitment of the man was based on his getting this kind of group therapy. And it's the only reason why he was there. That's right. So when they take that away, they have, they have frustrated the sentence itself. The sentence is no longer a valid sentence. So that I felt very badly about this. Judge, wouldn't you agree that about 70 or 75 or more percent of crime that we see in Philadelphia is drug or drug related. It must be and I think crime. it's just, you know, it really bothers me when there is no emphasis on the part of the police department 
to look at the, the problem of the, the drug addiction in the city. You know, it is common knowledge that at certain locations in the city, and the number is increasing, you can go and like buying candy in a store buy drugs. And when the prison, when you know, nobody has enough consideration to go into the prison and provide a service, oh, put up the exp- Wait a minute. I just let, heard let, that there was a program going on. I know there was by the state, and I'm talking about when the city, when the city, where the crime is, where a city is concerning itself with law and order and crime, and they're not doing anything about it. They're not putting anything in the prison, any money, to to rehabilitate in any way these people before you send them back out on the street. I think it's disgraceful. Yeah, but but you started by saying you know the, the people no, in the prison don't well, concern say. themselves. I, no, I'm saying that the people in authority. You, you, I, I say you stay uptight because you're a prison authority. That, that's that doesn't relate to you. So. Yeah, this is I true. Think, I think, I'd like to ask I think, I'm not question. talking about you. I think, you know, I'm talking you're about looking, the people that appropriate no, the money no. to give it to the well, prison to different. do the work. Because here, here, the prison wants to do something about it. Well, listen, I'm saying your toes are not being stepped on. I'm so not, don't be I'm not defending uh, myself. I think, Judge, this is because the public is apathetic to the plight of I think this is part people. of the problem. I think well, that pe people don't realize that if they spent a little bit of money, maybe one or two men up there reaching the, uh, the addict population, uh, they could do so much to stop what happens when they come out. Putting people in prison because they're addicted to drugs is not going to help. A person can be in jail for 10 or 15 years, and when he comes out, he has the same addict personality, and he'll go right back to it same un symptomology. unless he has some type of treatment in the prison. And we were trying to start a... a, a some type of treatment and there just isn't money available. I don't know why if so much money is being spent I think the public should know that by spending a small amount of money in this area that is treating the addict population in the prison could do so much to preventing uh, these people from committing other crimes when they come out and by curing them and getting them back and rehabilitating them. I would only argue with you on one point when you say that money is not available. I think money is available but it's just not being directed into the channels where it'll get the most use. What about uh, Ruggiero? Is he doing, is his program accomplishing anything? Well, this is a program. It's about time I can say a word now. I I'll mean, I gave it to you for an hour. Okay, I just and I heard this all stories, and I just want to say that you're all very nice people. You're a nice judge, you're a nice <laughs> doctor, you're a nice attorney, but I'm still, this is all repetitious, and I'm against everything you say because we went through this whole story over and over again for 20 years. This is nothing new. And all I can say is that our philosophy is that we feel that every man should be punished for the crime that he has committed. But he must be uh, punished on a humane type and constructive basis. With rehabilitation in mind and with reintegration back into society by giving him something that he can strive for, a job, a home, and clothing, and something that he can work for to better himself, to put him back into society the way you took him out of society. And don't get that man in a worse position than what he was. And these are the same concepts about, about uh, pre-release and halfway house and uh, changing. If you're going to change the prison system, Dr. Jones, is so much as you say you are, computers and everything, I'm going to commit a crime to actually get inside so I don't have to go to college, you know. After all, why is there a prison? <coughs> The prison is for these judges to send them there, but not to send them for 20 or 40 years.